Meet the Shmoo, a subcultural comic icon created by Al Cap in 1948 to satirize welfare politics. First appearing in the comic strip Lil Abner, Shmoos are the ideal food source. They feed on air, reproduce asexually, and happily turn into a meal whenever someone looks at them hungrily. Unfortunately, reality has no equivalent for the Shmoo. Instead, our food is extracted from the environment at great expense. For example, one liter of orange juice grown in Florida is estimated to require 958 liters of water for irrigation and 2 liters of fuel for other production costs. Yet these hidden costs do not seem to discourage rampant food waste. As much as 30% of all edible food in the US is thrown away. That's 96.4 billion pounds yearly. We began to wonder. <laughs> Welcome to Princeton University, home to brilliant minds, the orange and the black, and really old buildings, as well as four students who decided to spend a few weeks over the summer addressing this issue and looking for the shrew in today's world. And that's how we found the Freegans. Freegans are a group of anti-consumerist activists who are widely known for getting their food by dumpster diving. A search of the web revealed a particularly high-profile Freegan group in New York at freegans.info. We headed to the city to learn more. Meet Janet, one of the organizers of the Freegans. She's a high school Spanish teacher when she's not leading a dumpster dive. Not that that's all Freegans do. Freeganism is not only dumpster diving, but those of us who live in the city, this is a way to get our food without contributing to this system of destruction. As far as lifestyle changes go, dumpster diving, while interesting, seems to lack the broad appeal needed for widespread adoption. But maybe that's not the point? So we're not doing this only so that we can get ourselves free food for the night, for the day, but because we're trying to change the system that causes so much waste. As we watched the footage of our Freegan expedition, we realized that our shmoo began to sound an awful lot like a quick fix to food waste issues, which Freegans condemn in favor of changes in everyday choices. With this new idea of the shmoo in mind, we began wondering what it would be like to try the Freegan lifestyle for ourselves. So Kristen and I decided to not purchase any food for a week, and instead rely entirely on other people's waste. We made an appointment with Stu Orifice, head of the Princeton Department of Dining Services, to see if the dining halls would afford Kristen and I any free dumpster snacks. 25.6% of our dining purchases are local. And roughly, and if you took it, uh, if you took a snapshot of our sustainable purchases, we're in the 20% range. Princeton's dining services turned out to be a shining beacon of both sustainability and food waste management. Well, most of the food waste that okay. that we talk about are the uh, the trimmings from you know like if you get a head of broccoli you know some of the trimmings we don't use all of that uh, the lettuce leaves so that will go into a bucket in production that goes to the pig farmer uh, there may be an entree on the line that is not usable for us a half a pan of lasagna for example but that can go to a soup kitchen uh, so those things are packaged for the soup kitchen and frozen. Uh, the items that students take off their tray that get sorted, food and non-food, that goes to the pig farmer as well. But our view was I could spend $20,000 on a marketing firm to get the story out, or I could put that toward organic bread. While Princeton's food waste policy was quite admirable, it also meant Kristen and I had to look elsewhere for dinner. We're not doing so well, so we're going back to our friend Alex in New York City. Um, and he's going to give us some tips and tricks, hopefully, for freeganism, and hopefully take us around and get some actual food, because we're extremely hungry and tired of bread and bread-related products and onion things. So it's a Thursday night, and we're going to head over to the east side of Manhattan, one of the wealthier districts in the city. And uh, we're going to see what we can find. It's a random night. We haven't done any research. We haven't, you know, called ahead to see if they're putting a lot of trash out. We're just going to 
you know, see what's thrown out on a random night in Manhattan. They have this huge overstock out of, you know, terror that somebody would come in at 4.45 before they closed and not be able to get the flavor of bagel they want. And they'd rather throw it out than reduce the price and, you know, let some people who can't afford, you know, designer bagels from Cafe Trend here, um, you know, eat them. It's totally ridiculous. That night, we stayed up late, talking about books, gorging ourselves on muffins, and watching Alex's cats. We got up the next afternoon and talked to Alex about freeganism. Uh, my name is Alex Byron, and I'm going to be a senior at Princeton University next year, and I'm from Flagstaff, Arizona. I actually, it's kind of amusing. I've been a, a vegan for a while. My girlfriend sent me a new link to a New York Times article with the header, if you become one of these, I will break up with you. And it was a link to an article about this group of people called the Freegans, who I had never heard of before in my entire life. The logic of vegan is that if you object to the way animals are treated, you're just going to not participate in consuming animals at all. It's not a matter of, you know, trying to buy sustainable or humane slaughtered things. You just say, if you're a vegan, I'm not going to eat any of this. I'm not going to buy anything that has any animal products on it, because I think the system is just wrong. And freeganism just takes that a step further in saying, well, if your objection is to capitalism, if you think there's something fundamentally wrong with capitalism, then why are you participating in it? You know, we have this impression that, oh, that's from the trash, that's dirty. And I think I went into doing my research with that attitude. Like, I came up to New York and I thought, oh, here's these people, they're going to be rooting through trash and they're going to find a couple of rotten pieces of fruit and eat them, and it's going to be really gross, and it's all going to be sort of amusing. Um, but even just from the, like, the first couple of hours I spent with them, I realized that you know, they're tapping into a source of food that is really you know, quite impressive how much you can get and the variety you can get. When it came to tips for us, Alex had one thing to say. Um, bagel stores. <laughs> I think uh, I will probably never buy another bagel for as long as I live. We headed back to Princeton with Alex for the 4th of July, and that evening tried the Wawa one more time. We found a bag full of pastries, croissants, donuts. They're all really good. They all look perfectly fine. I mean, this is a heavy, heavy bag. And then we found another bag completely full of other bread products and sandwiches, like bagels, bags of bagels, sandwiches, all of them expire tomorrow, sell by tomorrow, 7-5, more sandwiches, the stuff, look at all these sandwiches. So what happens if like we don't think we can finish the stuff and we have to throw some of it out? I mean, it's like well, it would have been wasted anyway. You know, yeah. So. so there's absolutely no loss. All right, I'm gonna throw the rest of this out. Food waste is really built into our system. It's not a matter of individual carelessness. It's a matter of the entire way we look at grocery stores and this entire sense that when you go into a grocery store, you want to see abundance. You want to see packed shelves. And the flip side of that is if you have grocery stores that are ordering so much food to present this sort of image of, 
you know, like, oh, you can come in here and get whatever you want. The flip side of that is that there's going to be a lot of food waste. Perhaps that is our problem. Corporations and individuals are buying and discarding as if we already have the shmoo, as though we have unlimited, constantly reproducing resources. Although there's a lot of excitement about the latest green technology and products, our neighborhood freegans teach us that no shmoo will come to save us, no miracle cure that will allow us to simply buy, spend, and dispose our way to sustainability. With no schmooze on the horizon, it's time to change things ourselves. Thank <laughs> you.